All right. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate all of you joining us. As uh, he introduced me, I'm a professor in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management up here in College Station at Texas A&M. My research uh, emphasis is primarily on invasive species as well as in ecosystem landscape restoration activities. I do a lot of work with prescribed fire in, in areas of, of Texas in addition to studying invasive species. So for the, the big picture sort of overview of global concerns related to invasive species, it, it's sort of no sort of breakthrough to, to note that humans have transported organisms to new regions for, for millennia, uh, effectively colonizing new areas and bringing plants, animals, and other organisms with them to the areas in which they travel. However, it's, it's really been only the last couple of hundred years where the tremendous increase in the magnitude and frequency of these introductions has begun to have highly negative consequences for a variety of, of Earth's ecosystems. And while many of these non-native introductions, of course, have brought tremendous benefits, much of our food, fiber, uh, medicinal products, a, a host of other uh, benefits that we've gained as a result of these non-native introductions, there have been some, some tremendous negative consequences in species that escape cultivation and end up in what we refer to as invading uh, surrounding habitats. They've been shown to alter uh, ecosystem assemblages and, and transform habitats from one ecosystem type into another. They've been known to threaten biological diversity. Um, in fact, one of the, the commonly stated uh, themes is that in a next to habitat destruction, invasive species are the second leading cause uh, contributing to potential extinction of extant uh, organisms. They disrupt critical biogeochemical cycles, alter ecosystem processes, uh, which can have ramifications for food webs and, and trophic interactions in ecosystems. And this causes not only tr you know, considerable known ecological and economic uh, damages, but there are a variety of, of unknown yet unanticipated consequences that may yet manifest themselves. The scope of the problem, just to sort of narrow it down, over 50,000 introduced species in the United States alone. Uh, I've got pictures up here of, of fire ants, which many of you are probably familiar with, and um, not the bat itself, but we tend to think of in invasive plants and animals. Um, the bat is native. It's this invasive non-native fungus that is threatening bat populations across the, the United States. Of the 400 um, species that are listed as in, in or 400 of the 956 species listed as endangered in the United States are at risk, as I, I previously stated, in, in part due to the negative effects of invasives. Economic losses are estimated to, to be greater than $120 billion a year in the United States alone. Estimates range upwards of, of $1.5 trillion globally. Um, and these these are, are due to impacts on human health, invasive species that may spread diseases or cause other negative consequences for human health, agricultural and forestry impacts, wildlife and, and trophic level disruptions to, to uh, natural ecosystems, as well as sort of diminished or altered uh, processes of, of essential natural resources, the effects of biofouling on water or alteration of, of riparian uh, ecosystems. Uh, soil alterations that decrease productivity or lead to other negative consequences that may, that may promote erosion, uh, increased or, or altered fire regimes, a variety of, of impacts that contribute to these economic losses. And of course, these are only referring to 
uh, what I'm going to define shortly as in non-native invasive species. It doesn't refer to the, the costs and consequences associated with problematic native pests, things like mesquite, prickly pear, uh, juniper that, that many of you may be familiar with. Um, th those sort of dollar estimates of economic losses that I just uh, attributed to invasive species are only for those non-native organisms that have been introduced and are causing ecological and economic problems. And it also doesn't calculate intangible losses. Um, there are a variety of, of people that would state their, their philosophical, ethical, aesthetic considerations that should be given consideration when talking about the impacts of invasive species. And it's not easy to put a strict economic dollar value on those losses, and yet they, they are costs associated with these invasions. So in broadly speaking, generally speaking, what's an invasive species? It's one that is able to successfully reproduce in a new range. It's capable of dispersing from its original introduction site when brought into that new range. And then once it disperses from that uh, original site of, of introduction, it's able to establish and persist by expanding its habitat in, in new and growing locations. Invasive species are found uh, globally in, in all terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, even in areas of Antarctic. There's some recent introductions of non-native plant and, and uh, microbial organisms that are uh, problematic non-native invaders. And these invaders, again, as I noted, not only consist of, of a variety of plants and animals, but things that, that may not be as commonly thought of, such as fungi and a variety of different microbial organisms. Now, there's a whole suite of, of synonyms. You know, what's the difference between alien species, exotics, non-indigenous, non-natives, barrel, nuisance species, introduced or invasive species? For the most part, the, you know, the general term, again, as I, I defined, uh, organisms that are capable of living outside their, their native or pres uh, presumed historical distribution, but but these terms are, are typically used as synonyms and, and used interchangeably. I will frequently refer to something as an alien species, an exotic species, uh, in non-indigenous species, and an invasive species, but it is important to differentiate between particularly non-indigenous and invasive. Just because something is non-indigenous or non-native does not necessarily mean that it's invasive. Most of our agricultural products are non-native, non-indigenous, and that doesn't mean that they're invasive. These invasives are things that escape cultivation and then begin to persist and alter ecosystems outside of the area where they are originally introduced. And getting back to this idea of mesquite, juniper, prickly pear cactus, some of the things that we're, we're often familiar with as problematic plants in the state of Texas, uh, many people will refer refer to them as exhibiting invasive behaviors and uh, various invasive characteristics. But generally, the, the preferred term for those native species that expand their range and aggressively displace uh, other native species is encroachment. It helps better differentiate between native and non-native species. That said, it's a bit of a semantic argument, and I don't get too bent out of shape if someone talks about uh, mesquite or juniper or prickly pear as, as being invasive. But there are individuals that feel strongly that that should be strictly uh, referred to as encroachment, and the term invasive should be reserved for those things that are not native to this historical range. So how do these species reach these new areas? Well, the two primary modes, accidental introductions and, and intentional translocations. The accidental introductions are really with these, these species acting as, as hitchhikers. Humans are very successful at, at transversing the globe in a, a rapid uh, both spatial and temporal scales. And oftentimes, organisms are accompanying us, even with many times without our knowledge. And when introduced to the right environmental 
sets of conditions, they can become established and become problematic invaders. There are also a lot of species that are intentionally introduced without the knowledge that they would become a problematic invader, but many of the things that we, we bring for potential food, forage, fiber, new sources of timber, a variety of, of you know, goods and services that, that species provide to human beings, then can often escape cultivation, can escape the the geographical area where we first introduced it and then can can become uh, invasive. There's there also the horticultural trade, trying to, to increase our aesthetic surroundings, various agricultural benefits like uh, erosion control or weed suppression oftentimes will lead to invasive species. In fact, the very properties that lead to those species being good at erosion control or weed suppression may contribute to their, their increased ability to invade additional habitats. And there are even old uh, cultural philosophical connections that have led to invasive species. There's this sort of famous story of an individual who uh, emigrated from England to New York and wanted all of the birds in Shakespeare's plays to be introduced to uh, Central Park there in New York. Well, things like the, the pigeon and the starling, uh, which were, were some of those introductions, are, can now be found coast to coast in, in North America. So there, there's a variety of reasons and, and means in which species get introduced to new areas. General patterns of invasion that ecologists have, have identified is, is that they, they tend to exhibit sustained rapid rates of population growth. Oftentimes there's a lag after introduction. A species will be introduced and it won't be perceived as invasive. It sort of stays in place. And that lag after the introduction has been uh, explained in two ways. One is a demographic time lag where an adult needs time to produce enough offspring and then those offspring have to produce offspring. And after multiple generations of that, there's now suddenly enough individuals that it begins to rapidly expand in terms of, of density and abundance ac across an, an area and then it can, it can increase its distribution. Another is that there may be some rapid evolutionary changes where the species is adapting to its new environmental conditions. And after multiple generations of adapting to the, the new habitat, it allows it to become better invasive. But we do see rapid rates of, of uh, expansion, extreme levels of dominance and ke competitive displacement of, of many of these invasive species where they exclude uh, the, the native species that were in the area previously. Um, and then they can also drastically alter ecosystem characteristics, modifying the nitrogen cycle, modifying the hydrology, water cycle of an area, influencing carbon, influencing a variety of different species in the, the food web and, and different trophic interactions. Uh, and just one example of that is a species I've done quite a bit of work with, uh, Triatica sibifera, or Chinese tallow tree. It used to be referred to as Sapium sibiferum. The, the taxonomists changed the name on us. But Chinese tallow tree, which is was quite abundant in East Texas and areas along the Gulf Coast, and as well as throughout the entire southeastern United States, originally native to China, when it begins to invade a coastal tall grass prairie, say in, in areas near near Galveston, um, it originally has very low abundances, but in as little as 10 years, it starts to become more obvious, more present, similar to the picture that I provide here. And then there's this rapid expansion and, and abundance increase to where in as little as 25 to 30 years without control of the, the Chinese tallow tree, it effectively converts a very diverse prairie ecosystem that's dominated by a number of different grass and forb and some shrub species to something that's now 95 to 98 percent Chinese tallow, making that prairie look like something that, that resembles this to in as little as 25 to 30 years, something that, that now looks like this, where it's, it's really 95% Chinese tallow and very little other species diversity and a complete change in the overall physical structure of this environment.
So are invasions common? You know, why, why do we introduce anything to a new area if there seem to be all of these problems and, and negative consequences? Well, it, it's, it's more of a rule of thumb than a hard and fast quantitative rule. But the general idea is that this, what's referred to as TENS rule, uh, applies to introduced species, where we can say if, if 100 new species were introduced to an area, really only 10 of them would be able to survive. You're not going to be able to get uh, palm trees outside of, of uh, massive ecological engineering to be able to sort of survive in, say, a, a New Mexico desert. But of, of the 100 species that you introduce, maybe 10 of them would be adapted to conditions that would allow them to persist with, with modest uh, habitat modifications or repeated introductions. And of those 10 that survive, really only one of them is likely to become naturalized and escape cultivation and potentially spread to, to new habitats and become a, a problematic invader. So the general idea is that really somewhere around one or less than 1% of introduced species become problematic invasive species, but that 1% can, as I've now noted, have tremendous ecological and economic consequences. So are there common causes for, for these invasions? I'm not going to spend a lot of time sort of getting into some of the specific hypotheses. I originally had a, a long laundry list, and, and Megan, for the sake of time, asked me to, to, to remove that, and I think it was a, a good move. But, but folks like myself and, and, and others who study invasive species are not only interested in trying to describe the, the patterns and some of the, the uh, consequences as well as maybe some management strategies for these problems but really are, are interested in trying to understand some of the fundamental mechanisms and suffice it to say that there are some some leading hypotheses that extend from sort of ecological novelty that these species may may uh, possess to having some some unique capabilities that don't currently exist in in the ecosystem that they're evading that allow they them to differentially to exploit it, or even escaping some of their enemies, the, the pests and pathogens that attack them in their native range, when introduced to a, a novel range, they no longer experience that enemy attack, and that allows them to sort of escape some of the, the control that they would experience in their native region and become invasive in their introduced region. So there's a variety of, of sort of controversial management ideas that I want to touch on briefly, and Megan will, will get into some, some practical strategies more. But you know, one of the things that we're concerned about when, when trying to assess the impacts that invasive species have on ecosystems is that, as I noted, you can't simply boil these things down to a, a strict dollar amount. Yes, the dollar amounts are oftentimes eye-popping in terms of the, the magnitude of, of the costs that are being exacted on, on communities where an invasive species is having a problem. But there is a whole complexity of, of other issues that um, are, are harder to, to acknowledge. I, I've got a uh, you know very cute cat, and there are probably many cat uh, enthusiasts here in our, our audience today. But feral cats are exacting a tremendous toll on wild bird populations, migratory bird populations. And there are people who enjoy watching wild birds. And so something like feral cats, um, their impact on wild bird populations may not boil boil down to a strict dollar amount in terms of the economic impact, but there's surely a cost that can be attributed to something that's philosophical or ethical or aesthetic that, it, that is being occurred as a result of the invasive species. There's also uh, issues associated with long and short-term costs and benefits that in many instances we, we tend to be more reactive than proactive, particularly when it comes to investing limited resources, time and money, and so the short-term uh, costs are, are often put off because uh, we, we aren't as good at, at grappling with what might be some of the, the longer term consequences. There's issues associated with what's referred to as novel ecosystems or no analog environments where some people are, are simply sort of adopting a, a policy of shrugging their shoulders and saying, you know what, we're now in a situation where we can't beat them, so we might as well join them or at least abide by them and 
except that these historical ecosystems that previously existed are maybe no longer ecologically or economically feasible to maintain and we may instead have to embrace the idea of non-native species assembling into these ecosystems causing extinction of other native ecosystem of other native species in that ecosystem and what whatever the, the new ecosystem that develops um, will be the one that we'll have to to accept and and coexist with and there's a variety of other uh, ecological economic sociopolitical ethical uh, concerns and trade-offs that, that need to be considered I, I frequently tell students in the classes I teach that the science is hard but all things considered the science is the easy part for us to figure out grappling with the economic and the social and the political and the, the cultural difficulties and complexities that are inherent in, in any human endeavor is, is where the really tough work begins. So then you um, asked a rhetorical question, is there a place for alien species in, in some ecosystem restorations? And, and many would argue yes, and this is quite common in developing nations where there's uh, potentially uh, a need that, that has to be filled for a particular good or service, whether it be forage for, for animals or fuel for, for cooking and heating, uh, a variety of different uh, wildlife that, that, that can be consumed, a variety of, of arguments that are made to utilize non-native species in place of native species where maintaining the native species is, is no longer feasible either ecologically or economically. But concerns associated with that are, you know, what are the costs of containing it? If you maybe satisfy a need, but you end up generating a, a consequence that it far exceeds the, the benefit of that need, um, those are trade-offs that, that need to be assessed. And, and what are some of the consequences if your, your non-native species moves off the site and then causes uh, reverberating problems in other areas? So there, there are those that would, would say that non-native species can be, be can, uh, tolerated or considered acceptable for restoration efforts, but one needs to be very careful about some of the, the potential consequences, both uh, seen in, in, in the contemporary state and also then in, in potential future uh, scenarios. I'm not going to go through this whole laundry list, but, but for those of you that want to look at it later, and many of these are um, are, are complementary, they're not, not individual, but a variety of things that, that a, a non-native species may provide. A, a nurse plant, like the picture that I'm showing here, where you can plant this non-native acacia in an arid environment, and then that can alter uh, environmental conditions to allow native plants to become established, as well as provide fuel and forage for, for animals and for people, um, guiding succession, in, Proving sort of uh, seed recruitment dispersal corridors for animals as well as for for plants to, to become established a whole variety of things that, that can be talked about phytoremediation is an interesting one where uh, soils that become toxic as a result of mining type activities are no longer able to support native vegetation finding a non-native species that will pull those heavy metals out of the soil and allow for for uh, restoration remediation to take place is is an important consideration where a, a non-native species might be a, a useful choice but the, again always thinking about various risks associated with this um, that that go along with eradication um, and what various social uh, ec and economic as well as ecological needs are and how they may be better met by a non-native species versus a native um, and, and can we tolerate uh, these, these non-native species uh, without harm coming to, to the overall restoration outcome not only in the short but also in the, the long term. Um, and in, in some instances, the idea of, of simply tolerating a non-native species because the, the costs and the damage associated with trying to control it are so high that it ends up creating uh, unnecessary collateral uh, damage that, that further degrades the system as opposed to maybe just uh, allowing a, an innocuous non-native species to, to be tolerated to coexist in, a, in an ecosystem. That said, um, although Hollywood had different alien species in mind when they, they 
created these two movies, um, there are instances in which alien species control is, is going to be necessary in a variety of different ecosystems. And there are, you know, in addition to, to some of the practical strategies that, that Megan will talk to you about here briefly um, as I finish, uh, there there's other sort of arguments that are made about that, that non-native species really should be considered universally undesirable because they're unpredictable. Just because something in this particular time and place does not seem to be a problem, the idea of being able to predict when, where, and which species are going to be problematic and how they may change as conditions change both ecologically as well as as genetically and evolutionarily um, may result in in uh, unexpected and, and dramatic disruptions to native species that are are not observed in the the short term but then later become manifest in in the long term and there are some that will even utilize the argument of well you know this is a species that is is now being introduced and it's increasing overall local biodiversity but uh, it's important to assess both the, the spatial and temporal scale in which those arguments are being made because oftentimes uh, an enhancement of to local biodiversity comes at the expense of say biological diversity or, or certain ecosystem processes at larger regional or biome type scales um, and, and an important aspect of thinking about control is early detection. I'm not going to go through all of this data in great detail, but this is a public paper I published a, a couple of years ago with some of my colleagues looking at Chinese tallow tree control in forestry plantations. And so again, these costs don't take into account all of the, the complexities that, that can't be given simple dollars and cents assessments, but these these uh, damage costs are effectively lost timber income as a result of Chinese tallow beginning to invade a plantation forest in the southeastern United States. And you can see that um, the costs, as there's no control, are, are quite high in terms of the, the number of dollars that are lost. And at some point, as the, the forest becomes more and more invaded by Chinese tallow, doing the control itself becomes quite expensive. You're paying for chemicals, you're paying for people to, to go out there and, and spray them or, or to utilize chainsaws to remove them. And so there's, there's labor costs associated with the Chinese tallow control that are coupled with the damage costs with the, the timber uh, uh, de decreases that take place. And what are uh, economic assessment determined was that it was really around this point where the Chinese tallow was less than 5% of the, the community composition in these forests where we ended up getting the, the greatest economic benefit. Yes, there were control costs and yes, there were some searching costs, but the, the damage costs were minimized enough that the overall cost as a result of this non-native species and its its degradative effects was was best minimized. At, at trying to get it at, at less than 5%, you spend a considerable amount of time in searching costs just trying to find the ones that you're going to, to kill and remove from the forest that it, it's lost. But but everything above 5%, at, at sort of 5 to 10%, 10 to 15%, you can see the overall control costs as well as damage costs go up quite high. And it, it's more effective to uh, recognize the problem, detect it early, and, and act quickly in order to, to, to minimize both the ecological and economic damages. And this holds true not just for Chinese tallow, but a wide variety of problematic invasive species. There's some really neat things that are that are being done, being discovered. It's a, an exciting time, despite all of the problems that, that we see. Where drone technology is helping with not only detecting wildfires and prescribed fires, but but helping deal with uh, invasive species detection and, and control strategies. This middle top photo is a, some uh, Iraq veterans that have come back to the United States and are working in a program where they're collaborating with these Labradors who have been trained to smell out invasive pythons, which are absolutely taking over the Florida Everglades and causing all kinds of, of disruptions to the, the, the fauna as well as some of the ecosystem processes in the area. Um, there's new DNA technology 
technology that's being developed where uh, individuals can simply take a sample of lake water and do a full assessment of the species that are present in that body of water, which is proved to be extremely valuable for early detection of things like the, the snakehead fish and the zebra mussel and, and other organisms that may invade an area but may not be discovered having invaded an area until their population densities get quite high and to the point where there's no longer a potential for control in them. This type of DNA technology allows for early detection and, and early mitigation. There's really neat things being done with terrestrial laser scanners that are not only useful for restoration purposes and trying to understand erosion, but are being used to detect invasive species and, and different successful uh, restoration methodologies dealing with invasives. There's a variety of challenges ahead. Um, public perceptions of non-native species are, are complex, multifaceted, uh, frequently contradictory, conflicting. As I noted, you want to create a, a hearty debate. Talk about controlling feral cats. You're going to have people very vehemently lining up on both sides of that issue. So there, you know, there's definitely difficulties that we face in uh, addressing some of the problems that invasive species are causing to, to ecosystems and how best to control those problems as they present themselves um, it, the scale at which these things happen are, are many times unfavorable to ge generate sufficient concern. If a, a problem isn't going to manifest itself really for 100, 200 years, it, it's hard for people to get really uh, invested in spending their time and money worrying about that problem when there are so many immediate and pressing concerns. And as I already noted, the, the science is hard, but relative to the economic, the social, the political, the, the cultural aspects of, of things, um, these are all going to be, be ongoing issues that we're going to have to, as a society, uh, grapple with. And before I, I hand things off to Megan, I, I'd like to finish with a quote from Dan Simbaloff, who I consider one of the sort of most preeminent uh, living invasive uh, species ecologists today. And, and uh, I'll just read this. The importance of intensive population biological research in dealing with introduced species, especially those recently introduced, is often limited. In the worst instances, the absence of population biological data can be an excuse for inaction. When a prudent decision or a quick and dirty operation might have excluded or eliminated an invader, Dan is, is a, a population biologist, much like I am. That's the kind of work we do. And here he is saying, and I'm agreeing with him, that what we do is valuable. But in many instances, the boots on the ground folks, the people that are going to go out there and address a problem, are need to be given the, the opportunity to, to make those those prudent decisions, those quick, dirty operations. He, he wrote this quote, and the picture that I show is, is of Calerpa. It's a common uh, aquarium plant that's utilized. This was being grown in an aquarium at the, the famous Jacques Cousteau Institute in Monaco. Those of you that, that have as much gray hair as, as I do will remember Jacques Cousteau. When I tell my students about it today, they have no idea who that is. But, but nonetheless, um, they, they dumped an aquarium out the window there into the Mediterranean Sea, and this Calerpa became established in a small area. These are famous oceanic scientists, they said, oh, it's not a problem. We don't need to worry about it. It's just they're localized. Well, in as little as a, a decade plus, this species of Calerpa spread throughout the entire Mediterranean basin and created these monocultures, massively driving out the biological diversity that was there before, having cascading effects on all kinds of fishery and, and other uh, oceanic trophic uh, food webs. And, and the, the, not only the ecological, but the economic damage was, was tremendous. If someone would have made that prudent decision and that quick, dirty operation to go out there and control that little patch of this non-native plant that didn't belong there when it was first observed, a, a tremendous amount of harm would have been alleviated. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Megan Clayton. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. That was excellent uh, and the perfect setup for us to talk about how do we manage these plants um, if we're already seeing ourselves in a position to where we have some to fight. So 
Um, that's kind of where I'm going to head today. Um, unfortunately, as Dr. Rogers said, I think he pointed out there's about 50,000 um, invasives in the U.S. And I believe I put in six because I felt like I wouldn't have time to cover that many. So we're going to talk about broad uh, ideas about how we could attack these invasive issues um, as far as plants go. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have questions where Dr. Rogers and I can field some of those. So first I want to start out with, there's three main theories, I would say, to combat invasives or noxious plants. Um, noxious plants is kind of how I refer to ones that maybe aren't identified as invasive as in introduced or on an invasive species list. But the first one would be eradication. So when we have a plant on our property that we don't want, of course, our ideal solution would be to eradicate that plant from your property forever and ever. Unfortunately, with many of these introduced plants, um, a lot of you, uh, I'm just scrolling through the list, I know you can agree with me that there are some of these introduced plants that are just really um, impossible to actually, um, to actually contain. So eradication may be our goal, but in the end that might not be exactly what we um, get. So anyway, that's what we're going to strive for. The second option would be diversity management. So a lot of times when you're managing your property for either livestock or wildlife purposes, um, you want to keep a nice diverse uh, plant community. You want everything, as I say, to play well together. And sometimes when we bring in these invasive plant species, they tend to take over an area and become more of a monoculture. And we lose a lot of that diversity that we may remember that land having or we may hope for that land to have according to whatever our goals are for the property. So the second thing we would maybe manage for is just diversity. And in that, we're conceding in a way that we may not completely eradicate a certain plant, but we're going to be able to manage it year after year to keep it under control and allow other plant species to also thrive um, in its presence. The third theory that we could think about for combating invasives is passive management. And passive management is basically uh, do nothing on a very simplified level. And the reason we might want to think about passive management is in some cases where us applying different management techniques is actually making the problem worse. Um, so one example that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, too, if we have time, is King Ranch Bluestem. So that's a grass that's really invaded a lot of pastures once planted on highways to um, hold soil, which it does very well. Um, this plant has then moved into pastures, and when people apply a lot of different management techniques to it, um, or do different practices on their land that they have historically done, it's actually causing the plant to... Um, move out in range and in um, the amount that you have on the property. So sometimes doing nothing may be the best that we can do for a certain situation. So that's the third one that I would consider. So when we think about how are we going to tackle these plants, how are we going to manage them, there's really four main management tools that um, we have in our toolbox for rangelands to, to fight these issues. The first being fire, the second being chemical control, then we have mechanical control and finally biological control, which is a little bit one of those mysterious categories, but that includes any type of animal or insect that might be used to reduce the amount or to control, actually kill, um, an invasive plant species. So when I say there's four main tools, a lot of times when we're talking about invasives, they're very tough. And so it might actually be necessary for us to think about these four tools being used in unison together in different combinations and during different timings of the year to effectively reach our goal. So not necessarily doing one treatment and that be the one thing that, that controls this plant, but maybe think about how they're all linked together to come to a common goal of some sort of management or at least suppression of a plant. So the first one we're going to talk about is prescribed fire. Prescribed fire is a great tool that's used to regenerate tons of landscapes that evolved with fire originally. Um, some of the pros may include um, controlling some plants, especially when we talk about brush species like blueberry or ash juniper. Um, that one is not a re-sprouter like many of our brush plants that we have in Texas. And so a fire could actually kill that plant uh, quite easily. 
It could also suppress a number of other plants, at least reduce them in size. That might be helpful if, um, say, you want to do some sort of chemical control, but you need it to be a certain height so that you can use the equipment you have on hand um, using prescribed fire to take the leaves off, top kill that plant, and allow it to come back so that you can do some sort of herbicide treatment is a really great use of prescribed fire. Also, prescribed fire can rejuvenate things. When we talk about introduced grasses, it can burn off a lot of that dormant material, create fresh green growth that a lot of uh, livestock, such as cattle, would enjoy grazing on. So that's one way to get them to utilize those invasive plant species and help keep them at bay, if you will. Um, prescribed fire can also be a good tool when you combine it with other treatments, like the herbicide example that I gave. Um, but it can be a way to reduce that structure, suppress a lot of plants that we have on our landscape. Also, fire is quite affordable. So per acre, it's a fairly cheap way to go for management. And there's a lot of help available, especially through organizations like Texas Parks and Wildlife and Natural Resources Conservation Service through the USDA. They'll actually come and help you implement a prescribed fire on your land. So that makes it a little bit more user friendly for many of our landowners out there who may not have a lot of experience with that tool. Now, unfortunately, I have to talk a little bit about the cons. So I want to balance our discussion here. And the cons for a prescribed fire would include uh, the ability for fire to spread species who are tolerant to fire, so such as the King Ram Ranch Blue Stem. Uh, when you burn King Ranch Blue Stem, they found under many different conditions that that um, will initially knock the plant back, but it comes back uh, thicker and hardier, and so it's really not suppressing or controlling that plant in any way long term. Also, prescribed fire doesn't have a lot of effect on the larger re-sprouting shrubs or trees. Um, and then, of course, it's not selective on plants within a community. So when you're even patch burning an area, it's going to burn all of the plants in that uh, section. And so it's very difficult to pick and choose which plants you want to burn um, with that type of treatment. So let's talk a little bit about mechanical control. Uh, there's a lot of pros to mechanical control. You can remove the roots, um, such as through a grubbing or a root plowing system. Um, you can also control um, or reduce the amount of stems or flowers to keep something from going to seed by shredding or disking the plants. Um, temporarily suppresses most plants with a me mechanical control option. Um, and you can use it in combination with herbicides. So sometimes people will um, mow to remove a lot of that dead or that dormant material on a plant and then follow up with an herbicide application. Or just like with fire, you can reduce the size of a lot of, say, brush species and allow it uh, to come back with new green leaf to a size that is able to be controlled with the type of equipment that you own for herbicides. Um, so another section here is the cons again. Um, I hate to say it, but mechanical control is something that we're very concerned about disturbing the soil with. So um, anything that we do mechanically seems to have an imprint on our soil. And we all know that there's varying studies that say that topsoil can take anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years to replace one inch. And so when we're trying to keep that valuable topsoil in place and a lot of the free native seed that may already be existing there, we want to be very careful when we apply any type of mechanical control to that pasture. Of course, mechanical control can be quite expensive. It's time consuming, and so the labor charge alone is quite high. The uh, equipment upkeep, if you own any type of mechanical equipment, you probably know um, there's quite a bit of upkeep for that. Um, that costs you something that has to be added into that expense. Also, plants can adapt to frequent mowing. So we've seen uh, time and time again where a plant will actually change its growth pattern. So it starts to grow maybe closer or lower to the ground instead of so erect um, when it's mowed frequently. So plants can adapt. Um, also, when you're trying to mow to keep plants from going to seed, there's examples of where plants start to seed earlier. So they may reseed within a couple of weeks. And so you find yourself in this pattern where you're having to mow more and more frequently to meet your goal of keeping it from going to seed. And then I put shredding equals therapy. And um, that's a really a huge generalization on my part. But in general, when we shred something, it looks good for a short period of time, but it's not really... Um, meeting our ultimate goal of actually controlling a plant. And so I say that a lot of times people shred instead of paying for a counselor. 
Um, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you've accomplished something and it does look pretty for a short period of time, but you're, that is some cost. Even if you own the shredder, that is some cost that you're putting into your land. And so it's important to consider if it's actually meeting the goals um, of treating those invasive plant species as you wish. Biological control, um, Dr. Rogers did touch on a little bit. It's a great way to use either livestock or insects to control different plant species. Um, a pro of this is that if you're using livestock to suppress your plants, it's also giving you a marketable product in return. So basically something that you could take to uh, the auction and sell. So that's a definite win-win. Um, some insects have actually been developed for some of these invasive species that have become a, of large concern. Um, there are varied results with those. Sometimes we have, um, as you see over in the con uh, column, we have insects that affect non-target plant species after they're done taking care of the plant species that they were brought in for. And so that has to be done with caution, but there is a lot of research going into developing species that will attack problem plants. Um, and also, Biological control can definitely be used in combination with things such as patch burning or shredding of palatable species to make them grow back in good green, uh, luscious growth that livestock would desire. And so that's one way to use that in a combination treatment and make biological control maybe work for you to suppress some of these invasive plants. Um, a con that I didn't touch on very uh, thoroughly yet is that it's not a solution for many invasive brush species or invasive many invasive species. So there's a lot of uh, toxic plants or larger brush that they just don't have any solution biologically for that just yet. So we're a bit limited in this category, but we don't want to take it out of our toolbox because it is a possibility for managing or at least suppressing quite a few invasive species on the list. Finally, chemical control. So uh, lots of pros to chemical control, one being the flexibility. You could do a leaf, a stem, or a cut stump treatment um, to chemically treat a plant or control a plant. Um, also, we have either individual plant treatment or broadcast methods available with chemical control. It's fairly economical. If you have a lot of the species, your initial investment might be high, but as you come back later as retreatments or follow-up treatments, um, it's quite economical to spot treat any invasive species that may come back in your pasture. Also, chemical control can be used quite readily, as we discussed already, with fire, grazing, or the mechanical treatment. So it's something to think about that might help give the one-two punch to actually push those invasive species over um, that they are needing to get off of your property. But of course, with everything, there's some cons. So a lot of the chemicals that are required to uh, control these invasive plant species require a TDA pesticide applicators license to purchase or apply the chemical. Um, a lot of things that um, are pretty strong, pretty active on plants may also be uh, more regulated. So that's one thing to consider. Also leaf sprays need to be timely. So if you're considering a leaf spray, it's important to do that at the right time of year or if they have flowers or do not, everything's going to vary depending on which plant species we're talking about. And then, of course, there's some aversion to the use of chemicals on properties. And although a lot of the herbicides that we use degrade quite quickly in our environmental conditions, um, that's something that many people consider when they think about using chemical control. We have a lot of programs available, such as our Brush Buster series, that helps people to decide what to put on a plant to use the least amount of chemical as necessary and to direct that right onto our target plant and have as much non-target effect as possible. So there's ways around that, but that is still a consideration that people bring up quite a bit when we talk about chemical control methods. So one thing I want to definitely talk about is prevention. So we we have all of these um, ways that we can try to control invasive plants when we once they get on our property. But as Dr. Rogers hit on, controlling these uh, plants early is the best way to ensure eradication. And then from there on out, you're going to have to work from a very preventative um, standpoint. One way is, of course, to monitor your property often. And one thing you have to do is learn to ID your plants. So if you don't know that some of these plants that are growing up on your property 
are invasive and might become a problem, initially they're not going to appear as a problem. So a lot of people get in a situation to where until it's taken over an entire pasture, they don't realize that that plant is difficult to control and is an invasive plant species that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. So be sure to check any road frontage on your property, um, ranch road sides, of course, any of your hay distribution points, because it's possible that in your hay for your livestock, you're bringing in some of these plants. Um, your residential areas, um, a lot of coming and going of traffic where uh, you might have built a house or um, a nearby residential area. Um, and a lot of times when people are thinking about planting things in their landscape, it's important to think about planting natives that uh, won't necessarily uh, go crazy and become a monoculture in your pastures nearby. So be proactive in your thinking when you're when you're thinking about what to plant in your in your home landscapes that are by your um, rangelands. And finally, think about checking out your livestock working areas frequently. When you bring cattle in, they may defecate and leave seeds that uh, weren't naturally there before. Um, also, a lot of people might come in to help you when you do a lot of the um, livestock working, and it's important to monitor those areas because a lot of times. We'll see stuff pop up there before we see it in the pasture. Um, another thing is to treat early and often. I can't emphasize that enough. We've hit on it, I think, three or four times already in this webinar. Um, spot spraying usually is your best defense. A lot of times you can use a high rate of uh, a chemical like glyphosate, um, which is Roundup, and uh, treat specific plant species to have as least amount of non-target damage as possible and treat it early because a lot of these plants are easily controlled when they only have a few leaves but after they get larger and more mature their root system is such that it's very difficult to control that plant so you'll do yourself a huge favor if you'll treat early and often. Be careful when you bring equipment or other vehicles onto your property so this includes pipeline companies, any type of hay balers you have on your property, hunters you must consider uh, where they're coming from, um, and anyone who really drives down our roadsides because there's a lot of introduced species on our um, highways that could get into your vehicles and then be brought onto your place. So also consider your own. A lot of times people are very cautious about who they allow on, but they forget that, you know, you might go visit one of your friends at another place driving your truck that you're going to drive on your property later. So do consider where you've been and what vehicles you want to use back on your, your uh, land. Also, you want to maintain buffers along fence lines um, bordering problem fields. So if your neighbor or your road frontage has invasive plant species that you do not have yet in your pastures, it's going to be very important that you um, do something to maintain that that way. So one strategy might be to avoid exposing the soil, and that would be done by not um, disking or burning right up to your fence line edge might want to leave a buffer in there or some people have tried the opposite approach where they're proactive they readily uh, disc and glyphosate um, a border around their entire field to try to keep out any of those plants so um, the glyphosate is applied uh, regularly to ensure that any new seed recruits are killed before that encroaches into the pasture nearby so next I want to take just a couple minutes and, and fly through a few specific plant examples that um, may be on your list, but I imagine most of you came with a, a totally different list wanting those questions answered. Um, one that we hear quite a bit about these days is bastard cabbage. It's actually native to the Mediterranean. It's an annual forb, as you see in that picture there. Um, it has a very large tap root. And one thing that makes it easy to identify, uh, in addition to its leaf shape and those yellow flowers, is it has a very distinct seed. So it'll have like a roundish ball with a beak at the end. Um, so Google that one and look up a picture of that seed if that's something you think you might have on your property. Um, if you mechanically remove it, you could take out the entire plant. Make sure to take that big tap root with it. Um, mowing could remove the flowers and reduce seed production, but it's not going to control this plant. Um, Another issue with bastard cabbage is that it grows up a lot in crop fields, and so we've seen some herbicide resistance to this plant through time. So once that encroaches into rangeland, sometimes we have some issues with the herbicides available to us in controlling that plant. Another one you hear about, um, especially over on the eastern side of our state, is Brazilian pepper tree. It's originally from Brazil uh, out that way. It was brought in as an ornamental 
Um, it is a pretty and unique looking tree, but very difficult once it takes hold because it becomes quite a monoculture of um, nothing but this tree. It's perennial, it grows to 30 to 40 feet tall, uh, it tends to shade out all other plants uh, that used to grow in that area. Um, one way you can know it's a pepper tree is where it gets its name is when you crush the leaves, it actually has a pepper fragrance. Um, unfortunately, we're limited to a cut stump treatment or a stem spray. A uh, stem spray with these trees, I put a frowny face there because it is very difficult to do a stem spray. It's difficult enough to do a cut stump treatment. Um, you can treat the leaves of this plant when it's very young, but after it gets any size to it, you're pretty much limited to a cut stump treatment um, to be effective. Chinese tallow tree is one that Dr. Rogers mentioned earlier. Uh, it came over from Asia. It is on the TDA uh, noxious list, which means that you cannot um, you cannot move this material. You can't uh, transport it, distribute it, sell it, uh, bring it in for any reason. Um, it is originally brought here mainly as an ornamental tree. It's really pretty. Its leaves turn red, yellow, or orange, so maybe somebody had in mind that um, they would give Texas a little bit of color in the fall. Uh, but this plant is uh, fairly easy to treat, luckily, uh, with a leaf treatment with Grazon P plus D at 1%. We typically do that July to September. And you could also do a stem or a cut stump treatment. Uh, mowing or prescribed fire is a temporary solution. Sometimes that's suggested as a way to control this plant. Uh, but that's definitely just a suppression technique. So you're eventually going to need to treat this tree um, with some sort of chemical method to actually control it. All right, and then I had a question the other day about a uh, giant reed, so I decided to include it in this presentation as well. Some people refer to that as a uh, rundo donax. Um, it's a perennial grass. It can grow over 20 feet tall. I'm sure everybody's seen it in patches, uh, either along waterways or on roadsides. Um, its flowers can be um, two feet long, those long panicles you see there in the picture. Um, we can treat a rundo with a mazapir, which would be like uh, tray names of arsenal or habitat for water areas. Um, we treat that with 64 ounces per acre or as a spot treatment, half a percent. Um, you can treat in the summer or the fall, but you want to have at least three feet of height. That way there's enough leaf to take in enough chemical to, to get that chemical down to the root. Um, repeated mowing and fire. Um, leaves root to reestablish, and so those are not recommendations for actual control of the species, but you can suppress it or keep it from spreading temporarily from mowing or fire uh, regimes. King Ranch Blue Stem, uh, one I talked about a little bit earlier, they think it was brought over from China. It's an introduced grass that was readily used by TxDOT to reseed the side of the highways and in fact used all over pasture land um, for soil erosion uh, prevention back in the day. Um, it's kind of a straw color at maturity. You can see the seed head there has several branches that come out at the end of each stem. Um, plowing, multiple disking events, followed by glyphosate, maybe even a couple of glyphosate treatments, and then replanting with some other plant um, that's adapted for that area is um, pretty much your, your only solution to getting rid of this plant. And even then, you're going to have to follow up with a lot of um, spot treatments with glyphosate to keep this plant out. Um, unfortunately, people try to mow, burn, plow, disc, or graze the plant, and all of them seem to promote the plant in pastures. So this is one where a lot of times, if we're not going to do the right thing, it might even be better to leave it alone. Um, on sandier soils, we see some evidence where this plant may actually kind of um, die back a little bit, or at least reduce its density. Um, if it's left alone, however, if it's mowed or are disturbed in any way, it usually comes right back. And salt cedar, uh, that's another one that's been a huge invasive plant issue. It's on the TDA noxious list as well. Um, it's a shrub that grows about 5 to 20 feet tall. You usually see it in saturated soils, or at least ones that are seasonally saturated. Um, it grows well in saline soils, but really you can find it in a number of different types of soil has a deep tap root. They can also spread vegetatively or sexually, so this plant can be really tricky to try to keep under control. Um, luckily, we have a lot of chemical controls with very high control ratings, 
um, amazapir is used, like as we discussed earlier, or a combination of amazapir with glyphosate. So again, amazapir is your arsenal or habitat, um, but you could also do a stem spray on this plant and that be effective. Um, you can do a combination of mechanical, chemical, and biological control measures uh, to help suppress the plant. Um, it has adapted with fire, so fire does not tend to, to knock it back for very long. And I, I read of one time about salt cedar that it requires a long-term commitment. So if that gives you any idea, um, a long-term commitment means that you can bet that you're going to have to do follow-up treatments and uh, maintain control of that property for quite a few years before you can say you've actually eradicated it. Um, so there's my email address. I'm going to try to address as many um, questions as I have as possible, and uh, Dr. Rogers as well. And then if you have anything that did not get addressed today, feel free, please feel free to email me at that email address up there, and I'd be happy to uh, get back with you. It looks like um, we've had a lot of questions here about khaki weed, which is uh, kind of a new one to me. Khaki weed's more of an issue in um, turf grass environments, but it could be spreading into um, a lot of pastures. It looks like William replied that he hasn't seen it regionally yet. It appears to be a nasty beast that's causing problems in Australia and Southern Africa as well as the U.S. Looks like most current chemical control efforts are only modestly effective. Um, that's right for what I know. Uh, khaki weed is a problem in certain counties in Texas. Um, this weed is one, it's kind of like grows real flat to the ground, has very thick leaves, it looks kind of succulent-like, and then has a carpet of stickers over it. Um, very little research has been done on it. Um, it has tuber roots, but it also can, you know, come up readily from new sprouts because that sticker is its seed. Um, glyphos glyphosate doesn't seem to work on that plant. Um, the seed, there's some research that says the seed may only be viable for a couple of years, so if you stay at it, it might be possible to get rid of it in your yard situation. Um, they use um, several chemical combinations on this plant. Um, as a pre-emergent, there's a chemical called isoxabin, and I'll type that in here, isoxabin, um, that has some uh, modest use, but also in uh, turf grass situations, they use Weed Be Gone Max, Trimec, and Spectracide. Um, I wouldn't know, because there's not any research on it, what to apply in a rangeland situation, but a lot of what they've used is dicamba and 2,4-D, um, and so that would be like Weedmaster or our Banville with 2,4-D, so those might be something to try, but again, I'm not aware of any research in rangeland situations on uh, khaki weed. What do you recommend for control for guinea, guinea grass colonies. Um, darn, Sarah, guinea ga grass was actually one I put in the presentation and uh, took out for time's sake last minute, but um, unfortunately, guinea grass is one that you kind of want to try to do a combination of if you can graze it and also um, spot spray with glyphosate, unfortunately, is the best thing I have to tell you. It's very difficult because we don't have a lot of herbicides that are um, selective for grasses, and so that's why a lot of times we're left with saying something um, stupid like, you have to go out and spot spray with glyphosate, because um, we just don't have anything else that's going to be selective with that plant. Um, Reed asked, do you have any experience in controlling reed, canary grass, and restoration projects? I do not, and I think that's going to kind of fall under the same things we talked about with guinea grass, not a lot of selective herbicides uh, for that use. How much control of the Bermudas, like coastal, to give the big four grass seeds a chance to take back over? So if you're trying to control coastal Bermuda grass, um, to do a native planting, you're going to want to use a very high rate, which is like 3.3 quarts per acre of glyphosate, if I'm not mistaken, but check your label, or spot spraying with a 1.5%, so pretty um, intense concentration. If you've already got uh, natives seeded in the field, then uh, you're going to be stuck with an, an IPT or an individual plant treatment spot spraying. 
with that one and a half percent of glyphosate. Um, but they could compete if your your big four grasses, your big blue stems, yellow Indian grass, all of those have taken a good root. Linda asks, could you please type in the possible chemicals to try on khaki weed as it's spreading rapidly in all directions? I live in the country and not just on my property. Linda, are we talking about a rangeland situation or a turf grass situation? Um, Dr. Redmond turned me on to Pastora for King Ranch and Coastal years ago. Doing two treatments a year for the past three or four years has wiped most of the KR out. Okay, so what he's talking about is only for coastal Bermuda grass pastures. Um, there is a 2 E recommendation label, like an add-on label, for the suppression of King Ranch blue stem. So only in coastal Bermuda grass pastures. And what you would do is apply Pastora um, at a one ounce rate um, once and then four to eight weeks later. So about six weeks later, you'd apply it again. So the idea is that you're suppressing King Ranch blue stem and at the same time, hopefully uh, fertilizing your coastal Bermuda grass pasture so that it takes hold and keeps that blue stem at bay. Um, and that is a fairly expensive application. And um, it is, again, just for suppression and only in coastal Bermuda grass pastures. Um, but I'm glad that's working for you. I'm very happy to hear that. I've seen some great results from research projects using Pastora uh, for Bermuda grass. Um, John put a no, question mark. Oh, okay, Linda, range as well as lawn. I imagine it spreads from multiple vehicles driving over the property. So in the lawn, uh, Linda, I will type those in here just in a second um, for you. For rangelands, I really don't know exactly what to tell you, but since dicamba and 2,4-D seem to be active um, on that plant, then Weedmaster or Banville 2,4-D might work. So I'll type that in for you well, as well, and that's for khaki weed control. And, and John, if you wanted to type out your question, I'd be happy to um, address Megan, that. Megan, there was one further upstream about recommending an herbicide that's safe for livestock. Okay. What do herbicides do you recommend that's safe for livestock? Okay. Um, Rancher Mama, there are a lot of herbicides that are safe for livestock. Some of them, um, such as Graze on Next, which is a really common weed control, may have a period where you cannot um, take the livestock to slaughter. So you might have some um, delay in that. But for the most part, um, all these are very livestock friendly. So what you'll want to do is before you purchase or use any of our rangeland herbicides that we recommend, definitely look on the label and see if there's any livestock restrictions. But um, a lot of them there are not, or it's something very minor. Um, sometimes if you apply something like uh, chaparral, then you can't take that manure and put it on your garden because it'll kill your garden. So there's some manure um, restrictions as well, but typically on rangelands, we're not picking up um, cow pies, and so that's not really much of an issue to us, but there can be some minor things, but for the most part, um, no huge restrictions. I'm going to go ahead and push out the survey. If by any chance your screen covers up, you can simply click on the Adobe Connect icon in the test bar and you can come back to the chat pod. Uh, please continue your questions. I guess we wait for more questions. Let me say that our next session is going to be October the 5th. Forecasting, forage forecasting decision support from Rangeland Systems. And we have Dr. Bill Fox and Dr. Jay Ankerer. So we're looking forward to having them. And again, if you're not following us, make sure you follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash txrange. Thanks, Pete. Uh, looks like we have a question. Do you have a recommendation for control of Johnson grass? Um, do you have experience with a whip applicator? So Johnson grass um, is one of those tough ones that um, Sometimes we use a combination of control on them. It can be 
quite readily graze if it's in a uh, pasture. In fact, a lot of times it's hard to find it in pastures because it's been grazed out. But then on the flip side, it has that issue of where it becomes toxic. Um, if you do have it at certain times of year, such as uh, during a first frost or drought conditions when the plant slows down, allows those toxicities to build up in the plant. Um, most of the time, Johnson grass, we're looking at spot spraying it if it's in a certain area in your pasture. If you've got it all over, uh, wicking could be a good application, and that's where a lot of people, um, if they have shorter grass, especially say it's growing in um, an introduced grass field like Bermuda grass, um, they'll wick where they're just hitting the top of that plant or the, the green leaf at the top of that plant and avoiding the plants that um, they would not want to contact with glyphosate because there's not, again, a lot of uh, grass-selective herbicides. Um, so that's kind of the basis behind wicking. I hope that answered some of your question. I personally do not have a lot of experience wicking. So most of what experience I have is from other people doing it and me being uh, lucky enough to be um, an observer of that. Do you have a recommendation we wait. for... Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, do you have a recommendation for grass burrs in native pasture? I'm afraid to use pastora because of the native grasses. Right, so uh, pastora is not labeled for uh, native lands. Um, let's see. I'm looking your question up real quick. As you look it up, let me go ahead and say uh, thank you all for coming today. The audience, a uh, pleasure to meet with you all once a month. And some of you all new, uh, please come back see us. Uh, Dr. Rogers, Dr. Clayton, a great job. Thank you all for being here today. It's been my pleasure to set this up. And thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Okay, I'm blanking on Pastora's uh, label, and it's taking me too long to look this up. So if you want to, Dennis, um, shoot me your, your email address there, and I'll get back to you on that. There's, there's a couple of herbicides that you could use. I believe Plateau is the other one that uh, people often look to. Um, but I can't remember if you can use pastora on grass burrs in native fields um, or not. The problem with pastora on grass burrs is that you need to um, apply it when they're only an inch and a half tall. So it's going to require scouting very early in the year and making sure that you apply it then. If you apply it later, it may keep the plant from going to seed, but it won't actually kill the plant. So it's a little bit too pricey, in my opinion, to use it just as a suppression for seed. Um, John asks, I believe Yopon is native. Yes, it is. Um, but encroachment seems worse. Recommendations for control. So John, Yopon is one of those that's um, really difficult to control, obviously. Uh, that's probably why you see a lot of it around. And to top that off, a lot of times you see Yopon growing under desirable trees. So uh, it kind of makes it double bad. Um, what we suggest is doing either a stem spray or a cut stump method on Yopon. Um, and then the chemical that you would use is Remedy with diesel. And if you want to email me, I can certainly get you those um, the specific directions for doing that. But you'll want to make sure to not do that when it's too hot outside. So uh, for instance, um, when we have very heated temperatures, our chemicals tend to volatilize more easily, and Remedy Ultra happens to be one of those chemicals that vol volatilizes. So if you're spraying underneath, say, a desirable oak tree, you're going to want to make sure not to do it when it's too hot because that, that chemical could go up and ding part of your oak tree. Um, otherwise, that's sort of our only recommendation because we don't have a reliable leaf spray recommendation for your opon. Okay, so I am answering the, the khaki weed issue here. Um, 
So on lawns, you could do a pre-emergent um, or you could do one of the post-emergents. And then I do not know for rangelands, um, but you could try a weed master or Banville plus 240. <clears throat> and the reason I say these is because those have dicamba and 2,4-D in them. And um, those chemicals seem to be active in some of these post-emergents that they're using on lawns. So that's where I'm getting that, but I have no idea if that will actually work on a rangeland. Did I miss any other questions up there? I don't think so. Gosh, there were a lot. I guess yes. I should have expected that. Someone asked about being able to tell the difference between KR and Big Blue. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yes, so KR Blue Stem and Big Blue Stem. Those are actually quite significantly different. Um, trying to to figure out how to put into words uh, without being able to pull up a picture. Um, Big blue stem literally will have a bluish tint to it. Um, and KR blue stem is going to definitely be a straw color. Big blue stem typically has what they call a turkey track. So it'll have two or maybe three big um, branches on its seed head, if that's a good way to put that. And KR blue stem kind of has smaller and can have has smaller seeds on its branches and can have more um, branching than that. Um, big blue stem is less likely to be growing in a big monoculture. Whereas when you see like on the side of the highway, uh, really thick patches of nothing but that blue stem, that's that typically is the King Ranch blue stem or one of those that look like it, like Clayburg blue stem, for instance. Um, so King Ranch blue stem isn't introduced. King Ranch or big blue stem is a native, uh, one of the original from our tall grass prairie, highly desirable plant that is grazed out quite readily. So if you've got, um, if you notice a pasture that's been uh, grazed quite a bit, it's very unlikely, in my opinion, that you're seeing big blue stem. It's probably more one of the introduced blue stems that are there. John asked, does burning kill the individual yopon plant or just control its height diameter? Right, John. So uh, burning does not kill yopon. It's a re-sprouter. So it will top kill the plant, but it's going to, at the very least, come back from the base. Um, it'll have basal re-sprouts. Good questions. Yopon's one of those that you just have to get mad enough at the plant to want to do uh, a lot of cut stumping or stem sprays because we just don't have another good recommendation for that just yet. And I think historically, these savanna ecosystems where yopon is becoming more abundant would have burned more frequently. I mean, historically, mm -hmm. there weren't these chemicals to spray, but the, the problem is as a result of fairly long-term fire suppression, the, the yopon has increased in density. We're reintroducing fire now is going to be largely ineffective, as, as Megan is saying. So, so you really have to resort to chemical control of it because some of the, the natural processes that would have historically kept it in check have been you know, dramatically disrupted. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I don't know as much about yopon as mesquite, but for instance, you can kill a mesquite tree when it's a year or two old with prescribed fire, with a hot fire, um, because its growing point is still close or above the soil surface. But once it gets any um, 
height to it that growing points below soil surface and that fire just does not get hot enough to kill it at the buds. Um, so that's why you see re-sprouting from it. And I imagine it's the same um, for Yopon after it gets of some age, uh, it becomes difficult. And it's just difficult for most ranchers to burn frequently enough to make fire an adequate control for um, brush control. Any ideas on greenbrier control other than the MAT 28 stuff that was mentioned in Tamu's slides years ago, but isn't as available as far as I know? Um, right, David. So MAT 28, uh, it's going to be, um, if it is labeled, it's going to be labeled as Envora um, from Bayer, because DuPont sold out their range and pasture division to Bayer some years ago. Um, it is not labeled yet for grazing lands. You could buy uh, the chemical as a method. Um, kind of in the right-of-way uh, segment, it's called Method, and mix that with Garlon 3A, and that will essentially be what Envora is, but you can only apply that on lands that are not grazed and will not have grazing indefinitely, so we're talking more like wildlife properties, um, so that's the only way that that chemical is available. Otherwise, our only true recommendation for green buyer control um, is a stem spray. Um, literally finding the stem and spraying that with um, our chemical mixtures. Or um, I do know that one of our uh, researchers who used to be with our unit did quite a bit of control uh, work on Greenbrier and he said that you know it's hard to cover all of the leaves on Greenbrier because of the way they overlap each other, pretty much just its growth form. And so um, spraying it multiple years is pretty much um, implied you're going to have to spray multiple years and so a remedy solution um, in water with a surfactant at 2% he said seemed to do just about as good as anything else um, so just know that you're going to have to come back the next year and spray more or do a stem spray method which um, can be difficult finding where it originates from but is highly effective if you can find it Uh, but do know on the MAT28 stuff, uh, they are still working to get a grazing label on that chemical. So we're still holding out hope, even though I think I've said it's possibly coming out every year since I've started in this position. <laughs> uh, I, I think I heard the answer is goats. Yes, actually Greenbrier is highly desirable by goats and um, other wildlife species. So... Um, if you can get some goats to eat it down, um, that might even be easier to find where it originates, and then you could spray it and get rid of it for good. Very good yeah. use of multiple management techniques. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Clayton and Dr. Rogers, I see it's a 120. Uh, thank you all, and thank our audience for coming today. I guess I'm going to stop the recording. You want to hang around and answer more questions?